welcome once again as we continue our study from Ravi Zacharias's book called Cries of the Heart from 1998. Uh, Dr. Zacharias passed away this year. Uh, the subtitle of his book that we're looking at is called Bringing God Near When He Feels So Far. And this is week two of covering his chapter on the cry of a guilty conscience. And I wanted to start today by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Dealing with guilt is one of those things that uh, we struggle with in this life. I personally um, as I shared last week, pretty quick to forgive other people. For the most part, I don't tend to hold a grudge, uh, but I really struggle sometimes with forgiving myself. I, I hold a grudge against myself if that's possible. So one thing we need to learn is that God has forgiven us. We are guiltless because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so since God is willing to forgive us, we need to be willing to forgive ourselves. In fact, it's almost, some would say, an insult to God for us not to be able to forgive ourselves. It absolutely is grieving to him when we don't forgive others. We are to forgive others because we have been forgiven ourselves. But this chapter is dealing with guilt. And last week we went through several ways that people try to deal with guilt. They try to expel guilt by irreverence, smother guilt by pride, conceal guilt by fear, and those are the ones we were able to cover last week. This week, we will look at the idea of, well, let me read the quote concerning those three. If expelling guilt by irreverence makes life unlivable and smothering it by pride makes one's life unaccountable, then concealing guilt by fear makes life unbearable. And so dealing with guilt in an irreverent way, full of pride or full of fear, is unacceptable. Those are not the biblical ways to deal with it. And we will be looking at three, two other non-biblical ways and then the biblical way today. So the other two non-biblical ways are to dismiss guilt as cultural, to deny guilt by innocence. And then we'll look at the way we should handle things, and that is, of course, to surrender guilt to God's grace. And this is the way the Savior has determined to solve our problem of guilt. And so that's what we will cover today. So first of all, dismissing guilt as uh, cultural. The most convenient escape in a confused society is to glibly brush aside guilt as a cultural appendage as just part of the way we've been kind of programmed by our environment. And I'll read for you in a moment uh, one of Dr. Zacharias's uh, illustrations of, of how this just isn't true. And this kind of gets back to some of the first lessons of the quarter. These things aren't just cultural. These things are built into us because we are made in God's image. Some things are just the ways that they are supposed to be. And again, because of God, because God is a moral God, because God defines what is truth, because God defines what is love, and on and on we could go, we, in turn, have those things built into us. We are people made in his image, and so there really is a right and wrong. It's not just wrong because our culture says it's wrong. And so this is how some people deal with that. Well, I only feel guilty because I've been programmed by my culture to feel guilty. Therefore, the guilt isn't even real. Now, what they're missing is God. <laughs> God is the one who made us the way we are. He's the one that gave us a sense of morality and a sense of right and wrong. 
Uh, Dr. Zacharias goes through a little bit of, of arguments through here, and then he says, no one can honestly be willing to concede to that position, that it's just cultural, for to do so would be self-defeating. If you get to the point where you believe there really isn't any right and wrong, then you don't have any right <laughs> to have this position and feel that it's right, because there is no right and wrong. And it's, it's a cyclical or a, a circular argument and as he says here, it's self-defeating. You get to that point and, you know, why should you even exist? Why should you even be willing to proclaim some kind of right and wrong? And of course, if you take God out of the picture, there never is a right uh, to do that. Dr. Zacharias, and I'm going to read uh, several paragraphs here. Dr. Zacharias writes, Many years ago, when I was in Cambodia, I personally witnessed what historians are calling the murder of a gentle land. Over several years, the people there have suffered much at the hands of murderous uh, demagogues. That small nation has lost millions to the cause of one political theory or another. One evening, some missionaries and my interpreter asked me if I would like to see a play. Eager for a break from the meetings I was addressing, I took them up on the offer. Attending a theatrical performance in a land struggling for survival was a very moving experience. There was a strange combination of escape and reality in the meager surroundings of the ill-cared-for theater. The story in the play was equally a cross between fact and fancy. It was the story of a young peasant who married a lovely young village woman. As they were blissfully on their journey to another village to set up their home, the prince of the land, traveling with his soldiers was captured by her beauty and demanded that the peasant give her to him as a palace concubine. The peasant resisted valiantly, and so by force the prince grabbed the woman and took her away with him. Dismayed and heartsick, the peasant hastened to the palace to beg the king to intercede for him and return his wife. The king was outraged by the poor man's charge and contended that the woman came by her own volition to live with the prince. To prove his point, the king ordered the woman to be brought to the palace for the hearing. When she was led before him, he demanded that she acknowledge who her real husband was. The moment of truth came, and all were gathered in the palace hall to hear her words. Behind the scene, of course, the king had threatened the woman that if she admitted that the peasant was indeed her husband, he would be taken away and killed. The woman, therefore, in great fear, when challenged by the authority in the court, softly but with evident trepidation pointed to the prince as her actual husband. The court went into an uproar, cheering the king as the peasant cowered under the weight of this rejection. The priest watching these proceedings demanded an inquiry and then announced to the people that something seemed wrong with the whole scenario. Why would an ordinary man risk the rage of the king by claiming that the prince's wife was his? I have the perfect solution to get to the truth he said. Then he proceeded to lay out a simple plan based on what he claimed was a foolproof truth serum. I will give both the prince and the peasant an equal dose of this serum, and within ten minutes the effect will take place. Knowing that one of them is telling a lie and will be punished by death for that crime, I suggest that each of these men be given five minutes alone with the woman, with no physical contact between them. A huge barrel suspended from the midpoint of a pole held horizontally was brought to the stage. It was so large it took two people, one shouldering each end of the pole, to carry this unwieldy equipment. The instructions were then given. The woman was to carry one end of the pole while each of the men in turn was to carry the other end, separated by the barrel. They could walk away to a secluded setting prior to the returning for the verdict. Each had five minutes with the woman. During the time she had with the prince, he did nothing but harangue her and threaten her with her husband's death if she ever spoke the truth. When the time came for her to be alone with her husband, it was fascinating to watch even the subtle hints of his love for her. He did his best to position himself that he, so he would carry uh, the brunt of the weight of the barrel and protect her from any strain. During the time they were alone, she wept and spoke of her undying love for him and explained that the only reason she had lied was to spare his life. If they had threatened my life, I could take it, but I could not bear to see you die, she said. 
He understood her plight and said that he would only speak the truth. They returned to a suspense-filled courtroom, and I might add to an audience filled with even more anticipation, all of us sitting at the edge of our seats. As all was readied for the serum to take effect, the priest announced that the truth would now triumph over the lie. At that moment, the barrel burst open and out jumped a little boy who had been hiding inside. He carried a pen and pad in his hand and had copied down all he had heard during the private conversations the men had had uh, while alone with the woman. The young boy turned his notes over to the priest. The priest read what they contained, and as he watched the prince lower his head and the peasant's face shine with the radiance of a returned love, he declared the truth. The audience in the auditorium could not contain its jubilation and roared with approval, only to see tragedy strike as the king ordered his soldiers to kill all who believed the young boy's version of the conversations. Anyone in Cambodia knew the double-edged tragedy of the play. The voice of truth had been silenced, and cruel men ruled the land, inflicting fear on the people. I sat silently even after the play was over and reflected how behind the drama lay some common values that bind humanity. The purity of marital love, the value of the truth, the cry to protect the innocent, the wickedness of unbridled power and the undying yearning of a people to see justice roll on like a river. These were not conferred culturally. These truths were self-evident, even in a Marxist-dominated land. I was quite taken by the story and overwhelmed with the almost childlike innocence with which the people discussed the story together as they left the theater. Families pondered the deeper truths. Couples exchanged views on what they had liked and disliked about the play. Clearly, there was a trumpet sound for honor and morality behind the whole tale. Thus, to do away with guilt as merely a cultural distinctive, valued by some and not by others, does not reflect the reality of our world, of our shared experience. We have looked at four options for responding to guilt. To expel all guilt by irreverence makes life unlivable. To smother it by pride makes one's attitude unaccountable. To conceal guilt by fear makes life unbearable. To dismiss guilt as cultural makes morality untenable. And this is a huge one in our world right now, uh, here in the United States particularly. People feeling that we only feel the way we do. We only think sexual things should be in a certain way. We only think marriage should be a certain way. We only think justice should be a certain way. It's because we've been programmed not by God, but by our culture. And so these things can be thrown out. And when our feelings change, then the morals can change. But that's not the way it works. And even people who try to be as flippant as they possibly can be feel guilt. So shoving something off as cultural just simply does not work. And the final one of the inappropriate ways to deal with guilt is to deny guilt by innocence. This brings us to the fifth and possibly the most insidious option, Dr. Zacharias writes, and that is to not feel any guilt because one has lived a life as best as is possible. There are multitudes who so live under the illusion of innocence. And of course, we have so many people who think this is the way it is. Hey, I've lived a good life. Hey, my grandfather lived a good life. Hey, this person's lived a good life. And so therefore, how could this person possibly be guilty? How could this person possibly be thrown into hell or not be accepted into heaven? And of course, it all comes down to someone's definition of good. Good compared to what? Good based on what level of morality? Good based on, you know, who gets to decide what the good thing is? And of course, we know that it's ultimately God himself. Malcolm Muggeridge, we've quoted him before uh, this quarter, once said that the depravity of man is the most empirically verifiable fact 
but also the most resisted by the human mind. We just don't really want to deal with guilt. We don't want to deal with our faults. We don't want to deal with an acceptance of, of what we need. And that is ultimately a savior. And we'll get there, of course, in a little bit. Dr. Zacharias talks about what do we mean, again, uh, concerning the good. And then Romans 3.23, very simply, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. No matter what someone's definition is of good, no matter what their definition might be of sin, even by their own standard, they have fallen short. No matter what level we put it at, we have failed at times to reach that level. Of course, we're given the ultimate standard in the Bible and in God and in Christ and in his spirit. And this is talked about even earlier in this book, this letter to the Romans, when Paul points out, you know, even judged against their own standards, they are guilty in Romans chapter 1. Another uh, Dostoevsky uh, story. He told uh, the story of a woman who died and went to hell. Rather perturbed by that, <laughs> she challenged the heavens to give her a reason why she was not there, not in heaven. Hearing her screams of injustice, Peter spoke to her and said, Tell me one reason why you should be in heaven. She paused, rehearsed, thought through carefully, and then said, on one occasion, I gave a beggar a carrot. Peter checked the ledger and saw that she had indeed done so. It was a scrawny old spoiled carrot, but she had nevertheless given it. Peter told her to hold on, that they would get, help her up. He took a long string, tied a carrot to the end of it, and lowered it into hell for her to hold on to. She clung to it, and he started to pull her up. Others in hell saw her gradually disappearing from their midst and held on to her ankles so that they could be transported too. As more and more of them kept clinging on, the string started to give way. And she yelled out with every fiber of her being, Let, Leave go of me! This is my carrot, not yours. As, she, as soon as she said that it was her carrot, the carrot broke. Even the best deeds can be self-serving, and we all need that grace of God to enter his presence. The most virtuous in this world are not too virtuous to need God's grace. And no one is so virtuous as to reserve the right to be the sole definer of goodness. That is God's prerogative. Claiming complete innocence in the eyes of God is unjustifiable. This leaves only one way to deal legitimately and reasonably with the problem of guilt. And that, of course, is to surrender guilt to God's grace. 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 7. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he arrived, he said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised her, and she grew up with him and with his children. From his meager food she would eat, from his cup she would drink, and in his arms she would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. Because he had done this thing and shown no pity, he must pay four lambs for that lamb. Nathan replied to David, You are the man. How was David able to deal with this guilt? Because we know at this point, he proclaims that he's a sinner. He realizes he just he needed a prophet to come to him and, and bring him back to his senses, so to speak. 
How did he handle his guilt? He did the appropriate thing. He surrendered his guilt to God's grace. Words of David after being confronted by Nathan the prophet in Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born and I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart. What a great proclamation. Dr. Zacharias writes, There's not a more familiar psalm of contrition. Here the worst of wrongdoing and guilt found forgiveness and peace. We need to be sure of one thing. This is not a cheap prayer of self-justification. David would pay dearly still for this sin, but his guilt was relieved because he gave it over to God's grace. You might recall our looking at Simon Weisenthal in his trying to deal with the Nazi soldier who was so desperate for forgiveness. One can sympathize with Mr. Weisenthal's reticence to deal with so great a crime in so simple a manner. But there's nothing simple about God's forgiveness. With all its grandeur and splendor, the temple had a bloody side to it. The sacrifice of, sacrifice of bulls and goats in an effort to find cleansing and forgiveness. When guilt surrenders to the grace of God, it makes the sin forgivable. You know, irreverence, fear, all these different things we've looked at. It made guilt unbearable, unlivable, all these different things. When guilt surrenders to the grace of God, when we take our sins to the right place, the cross, it actually makes the sin forgivable. God can pour out his grace into our lives when we respond the way we're supposed to, in faith. Another story Dr. Zacharias shares. He says, I recall standing by the altar of the temple of Kali in Calcutta, India. I saw a man dressed in spotless white clothing bring a small goat tied by a rope. At the altar, the head of the goat was placed upon the contraption that cradled its head. Then faster than the eye could see, the priest's knife had done its work and the animal was sacrificed. But then something strange happened. The man placed his own head on the same spot, bent down, touched some of the freshly spilled blood and marked a spot upon his white shirt before he left. I turned to a Hindu philosopher who happened to be showing us around and asked him what the symbolic gesture meant. Quite embarrassed, he kind of shrugged the question off, saying, it does not mean anything. Rather a bizarre act, I might add, for something that means absolutely nothing. Such has been the quest of religion. The Hindu pays his karma through millions of reincarnations. The Muslim intones, hopefully, inshallah, if God wills, even at death, never knows any certainty of forgiveness. But... The one who comes to the cross of Christ knows with certainty that the debt has been paid. This is the grace of God that faces the guilty one 
head on and is big enough to forgive. The guilt is eradicated completely. The Savior's solution as we wrap up today. Dr. Zacharias writes, you may or may not have noticed that on our way to a solution for how to respond to guilt, a very subtle, though enormous chasm was crossed before forgiveness was offered. The focus shifted away from guilt. And of course, I'll, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> the focus goes on to Christ, of course. Ingmar Bergman may have captured this huge chasm better than even he realized in his play Wild Strawberries. It is the story of a professor who had come before a judge to be sentenced. The judge looked at the accused and declared, I find you guilty. Guilty of what? demanded the professor. You are guilty of guilt, said the judge. Is that serious? said the accused man. Very serious, answered the judge. Dr. Zacharias then says, think for a moment. If guilt is all we have to deal with, where do we go? Where does one remove guilt? You might recall this from last week. Not all the perfumes of Arabia, said Lady Macbeth, can remove this spot. This disease is beyond my cure, said her doctor. Guilt must be dealt with. So, just from earlier today, recall the play in Cambodia. When the play was over, I asked my interpreter, so much went wrong. What was missing in this story? Though he was not a Christian, he gave me an answer I was not expecting. He said without hesitation, a savior. That's what was missing. And when we look at all these world religions, when we look at all these people who are lost, that's what they need. They need a savior. It was earlier in the chapter, but Dr. Zacharias quotes John Newton in Amazing Grace. And so let's end by looking at this great song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be, as long as life endures. And when this flesh and heart shall fail, and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess, within the veil, a life of joy and peace. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we've first begun. Dealing with guilt is a very important thing for us to come to grips with in our lives. We are guilty. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin, of course, is death. So what do we do with our guilt? We give it to the one who paid for it already on the cross. We give it to Jesus Christ. We give it over to our Savior. Let's do a better job of confession. Let's do a better job of forgiving, not only others, but forgiving ourselves. May the Lord bless you and keep you this week.